I apologize if you come to men's group. We did discuss this in men's group, but it was one of those messages that I really, I really loved and it really hit home with me. So I wanted to, to bring it up today. Also in the fact that just because of all of the cur current ruckus, we are going to start a series called Abide in Me, which is what Mark kind of talked about last week. Um, but I just wasn't prepared to start that today. So, um, so we'll do that. We'll do that later. So everyone open up to Daniel 2. Does anyone, uh, can anyone, <laughs> other than Peter, uh, um, give me a high level on Daniel 2? You know, if you read the title, you'll probably kind of come up with it. And actually, it's kind of a, that's an unfair question because you guys are not prepared and I am. So um, I will give you guys a high level. Um, so as you guys know, in the book of Daniel, it talks about when the nation of Babylon comes in and they, um, and they bring Israel into captivity, Okay. And they bring it, so they, 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 they take them, they take a lot of their stuff, they take the people and all of this other stuff, and they go and they take them to Babylon. And the king at the time is Nebuchadnezzar, who's this really, really powerful, powerful, powerful man, right? He's also a very, very evil man, right? Um, and I don't want to say, it's not like he's doing anything like, you know, he's not killing babies or any of that other stuff, but he worshiped pagan god. He's powerful. He's like the most powerful empire on the earth at this time. So he's got a lot of pride. He does it his way. He does, you know, everything that, whatever he says kind of goes. And, um, and he gets this really, really weird dream, right? And this is dream that doesn't sit well with him. So um, he's trying to have it interpreted. So that's kind of the backdrop for, um, for Daniel 2. Now in Daniel 1, which is important to know, uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, they're all, you know, getting pulled into like the king's court. And, um, but they themselves being Jews, they refused to sit at the king's table and eat of their delicacies, right? Because they have been set apart and they knew that even though they had left their homeland, they knew that we are different. We're not going to adhere to the culture here. So, um, so we're going to live a little bit differently. And, and, um, it ended up causing a little bit of a stir and they said, look, our way is better. So they did a little test, right? You guys eat what you eat. We're going to eat what we eat. And whoever wins, wins, right? So obviously, Daniel, um, Daniel, Daniel's diet was, was better, and it was one that looked a lot more like our fasts. Um, and, and they basically, and that brought glory to the God of Daniel, the fact that it was, it was healthier. So he ended up um, having a great reputation because of the fact that he was very wise, and he got pulled into like the, one of the king's wise men. So now we'll, we'll pick up. So, and just, just extra credit, right? When we're reading this story and just what I've already said about Babylon, okay? So what does Babylon symbolize in the book of Daniel? Any ideas? The world, right? Because they were not of the world, right? But they, they, they left kind of like Jerusalem, which was like the heavenly place, and they got pulled into the world. So just kind of, you can have that in the back of your mind. So Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he has this really, really weird dream right? And it was something that was on his mind and it took sleep from him. It said that he couldn't sleep. And I think if every one of us was honest, we've all had those days. We've all had something, something happen to us, right? It might not be a dream. It could be a situation. It could be something. Um, and it's just keeping you up. And I think that we go through these times when we're living in, in something and we know that there's significance there. We might not know what it is at the time, but there's like a heavy burden on you. And you say, something's going on, something's important. And at this point, that's what Nebuchadnezzar was experiencing and it was stealing his sleep from him. And, and he knew it was significant. And he does this thing, which is really, really weird. And if you read the chapter, what he does, he goes to all of his like wise men, right? Like the people in his courts, it was actually kind of his dad because he was like kind of like newer into the kingdom, but it was his dad's wise men. And these were the people, I think, what do they call them? They call them, um, the, he says, he gave call, command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, to tell the, king, um, to, tell, to tell the king his dream, right? So he did this really weird thing where he called all of these people who were supposed to have the answers. Um, but it also seems like Nebuchadnezzar, he had some trust issues because he didn't just call them and say, hey, can you come you know, tell me what my dream meant? Because he didn't trust them. So instead, what he actually did is he says, I want you to tell me my dream, right? Tell me my dream and interpret it. So I'll ask you, is that unreasonable? 
Like, was his request unreasonable? Like, you're calling these people in. You said, hey, tell me my dream. I'm going to ask you guys, people, how many people were there for that? One, right? <laughs> it was his dream. Like, nobody else was there. Nobody else was witness to it. So did it seem unreasonable what his request was? If you look at it, you're like, that's unreasonable, right? And if anybody heard what Nebuchadnezzar was probably asking, they're going to look at him and say, hey, that's unreasonable, right? But then you start, I start asking you something and say, well, let me ask you this. These magicians, astrologers, and sorcerers, what do they claim? Yeah, they claim to have these powers. They claim, they claim to know the future. They claim to have all the supernatural stuff, right? Um, not only did they claim it, but you really think about it. This is how they made their living. Like their whole claim to fame and the whole reason that they were like in the king's courts and enjoying everything that they were enjoying by that position is they claim to have this power, to have some sort of access to the gods and that they can gain information from the spiritual realm. Um, now, if that was true, this wouldn't have been a big ask. They should have been able to step up and perform it, right? And, um, and it's easy to judge him, right? It's easy to judge Nebuchadnezzar and basically say, how could you even ask that? Like, that's not reasonable. But what do we do, right? Like, you think about it, I'll, or I'll see, like, when, when we're upset about something, when something's not sitting right with us, when we have unanswered questions, where do we usually go? And I will tell you that we usually don't go to magicians, right? But we'll go somewhere. And a lot of the times, we'll try to go to the easy place to get an answer. If we're honest with ourselves, we'll even go to the place where we think we will hear what we want to hear. And I think that we all have that one friend that will have a problem and they'll talk to every single person until they, want, until they hear what? What they wanted to hear. And I'm going to tell you guys, if you don't have that friend, congratulations. You are that friend, right? Because they are everywhere. So, it, so then, you know, it goes on and they're telling Nebuchadnezzar like, hey, like your request is a little bit crazy. Like if you tell us a dream, we'll interpret it. But it's not fair for you to like think that that we can like you know that we can have access to the dream that only you had. And I love the words that they even use. And it says that there's not a man who can do that. And I'm going to ask you, were they right? Oh no, they were right. There's not a man who can do that. But who can? God. Right? And in case you know how the story goes, right? This was not Daniel who basically said, oh yeah, I'm going to be able, I, I, I can tell you, you know, is that this stuff can only come down from God. And even though the, these magicians, these sorcerers, you know, these, these funny people, you know, even they could do some stuff, they also knew that they had limitations. Some things can only come from God. And when I read that story, and I said, you know, I guarantee you that these magicians and these sorcerers and these Chaldeans and like, they were able to probably add some value to the king at one point or another. It reminded me back to the book of um, when, when Moses, you know, went and he approached Pharaoh, and he had these plagues. And many times, what would happen? Moses would show them a plague, and what would the Pharaoh's magicians do? They would mimic it. Which, we have to be honest then with ourselves, is like, look, all of the magicians, the sorcerers, all this other stuff, can they do stuff? Yes. And I'm going to ask you, are we talking about magicians and sorcerers of the Old Testament? No. Guys, we have to be very honest. Like, do we think that the spiritual realm with all of that stuff, like, stopped, like, in the Old Testament? We actually, to be honest, we actually see a lot of it even in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, where you have these sorcerers who are pulling off some stuff that looks a little bit strange. Do you think that all of that just kind of went away? Of course not. That's still, it's very much, it's just as real today as it was thousands of years ago. But we have to remember that some things can only come from God. They can mimic, but they, but they do not have all of the power that God has, right? And they even tell him, the sorcerers and stuff, they tell him, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things, 
right? So I love their strategy, right? What's the strategy? Like this is the definition of a toxic relationship, right? Because he's saying, if you guys supposedly are magicians and sorcerers and have all of this access to the spiritual realm, tell me my dream, right? And their toxic response back to him is what? It's not me. It's not that I'm not competent. It's that you have a problem, right? Like you're the, you're the reason that this relationship isn't working out, right? It's not me. You're not being reasonable. And then Nebuchadnezzar basically flies off of the handle. Well, actually, let me take a step back just because I feel like toxic relationships are worth talking about just for like a very, very quick second. Do you guys have a relationship in your life that whenever you bring up a valid concern, that person flips it back around? Because that is like the definition of a toxic relationship. And it's exactly what we see here right? He has a valid concern, but the second he brings it up to the person, the person comes right back and says, that's not a me problem. Like you're not being reasonable. And I think a lot of the times we need to slow down and pump the brakes on some of our relationships. And if they're toxic, then maybe we need to reanalyze what that looks like. We need to think about, okay, what are the proper boundaries? What's acceptable? Not what's not acceptable. And you can't just always fall into the, okay, you know, cause I feel like a lot of the times, especially as Christians, we run into the, well, I don't want anybody upset, upset at me, right? Or I'm just going to love more, or I'm going to sweep more under the rug, or I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that in hopes that you're going to fix this toxic relationship. But in reality, what that toxic relationship might need is some boundaries, right? Maybe you lose some access. And I'll tell you, you, and if it's a really toxic relationship, you can always do what Nebuchadnezzar did in the next verse, which was um, he gave a command to destroy all of the wise men in Babylon. That might be a little bit extreme, okay? But he got so angry and furious, he came to realization. And he realized that these false prophets and, the, and, and what they were pitching was completely worthless. He had no use for them because he couldn't, they couldn't give him the wisdom of God. And when he realized that there was no use for them, what did he do? He basically com commanded them all to be put to death. That's a little extreme, okay? And I'm going to tell you, if you're in a co toxic relationship, that's not the solution. Right? <laughs> we don't need to put anybody to death, right? But what I give him credit for was when he realized it wasn't working, he cut it off. Like, think about that. When he realized it wasn't working, he cut it off. And I'm going to ask you, how many things do we have in our life right now that's not working? It could be a sin. It could be a relationship. It could be a coping mechanism. It could be whatever it is, right? And every single time we keep running back to it, we keep running back to it. And at the end of it, it's not working, but we still allow it to stay. So big ups for Nebuchadnezzar, who at least realized it, and he cut it off, right? And our challenge is for us, if we, if we identify something in, in our life that is not working, can we cut that off? Can we decide that there's no place for that in our life anymore? It is not answering the questions that we are asking. It's not meeting that need and that we just cut it off. Well, up until that, that's all great, right? And I even love the fact that Nebuchadnezzar said, we're just going to kill all the wise men. Like they're worthless, they're not meeting my needs, they're not, you know, they're not doing what they need to do, they're not even, they're not doing what they promised that they would do, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna kill them all. But there's only one problem with that. Who was one of the wise men? Daniel, right? He was about to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Like that's, that's a really, really big problem. So it comes back to Daniel and he hears that, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's upset, <laughs> right? And he's got this decree that they're going to kill all the wise men and it's not looking good for him, right? Um, but Daniel obviously didn't do anything. And he was innocent from all of this stuff. He never claimed to have these false powers. But the one thing I love about Daniel in the story is that he totally kept his cool. He didn't overreact, even though he was told that he was about to be put to death. Now, I will tell you, if, and Nebuchadnezzar, everyone believed it. It was known that guy was crazy, right? But I love the fact that even though he was faced in this situation, he didn't, he didn't freak out, uh, remain calm, and he dealt with it correctly. And I came across this verse, and I love, oh, not a verse, it's just a saying. It says, how you act in crisis shows what type of person you really are. Crisis does not make the man, it reveals the man. And if you think about that, it really makes you think, how do I react in crisis? 
because I think it talks a lot more about like our belief system than, um, than we like to give it credit for. Um, on a personal note, when all of this went down with Daniel, the, one of the first things that I did is I picked up my phone and I called Ember Bulis, right? And, and we were chatting and I told him, I was like, hey, I'm kind of a mess right now. So, you know, like, this isn't, this isn't good, right? And then, um, and he just replied back with, just, do you trust the Lord? Right? Because if the answer is yes to that, then I should look a lot more like Daniel in this passage. Right? And if my answer, I mean, if I don't look like Daniel in, that, in this passage, well then, what does that really mean about how much I trust him? Right? And what we see in Daniel here is Daniel was cool, collective, and the only thing he did was he asked the king to give him more time. Right? Just give me a little bit of time. And I don't think that Daniel here, it was a stall tactic. I don't think it was just a way to like, you know, try to think of another way to get out of it. I think what it was is that Daniel knew that listening to the God wasn't going to be a fast process. He knew it was going to take time. And many times we have to wait on God right? But that's the hardest thing for us to do. Or if we're up against opposition or if we're in the middle of a situation, we want God to speak fast. But I love the fact that Daniel here set the expectation that this is going to take a little bit of time. And he was willing to take that time if the king would grant it. So right after that, what Daniel ends up doing actually shows a lot of wisdom, right? Because he, he knew that hard times re require community. And it said that he went to his friends, right? He made his decision known to Hanan Hananiah, Shadrach, and Azariah. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which are like their normal names, right? And he shared his troubles to the people that were closest to him, right? He knew he was up against a hard time. And he basically went to his friends because he, he knew he didn't have to carry that burden alone. And neither should we. And I'm going to tell you one of the things that I feel that we're not very good at is we're not good at carrying burdens with other people. We're not even good about sharing our burdens with other people, but that is what the church is for. That's why we have community, because the burden of one is very, very heavy. But when you share it amongst a group of people, that burden gets significantly lighter. And it says that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven. Because they were in a situation where God was literally the only person that could meet their need. There was no other way. What the king was asking was too big, right? It was too big and nobody else could do it. And they knew how important it was that they all decided, the four of them decided that they needed to get together and they needed to pray. And I'm going to tell you guys, as a church, we need to pray more. So many times, if I was honest in my own life, when we have a problem or a situation or, or, or just, a, just any hardship, we're quick to seek answers, right? We, we're quick to ask the sorcerers, the magicians, right? To put something together ourselves that can get us out of that situation. But I love what Daniel did here where he basically went, grabbed his friends, and they said, we need to pray more, right? Because we know that the only thing that's going to get out of the situation is divine intervention and that God will get involved and he will solve it. Um, because I believe that that's where victories are won. And the crazy thing here is Daniel had confidence that God would do an unprecedented miracle. Nothing like this has ever been asked in the Bible, and nothing like this has ever been accomplished in the Bible before this, right? Even Joseph, who had interpreted dreams with God's help, he knew what the dream was, right? But the whole fact that he wouldn't even know what the dream was, you know, he was asked to reconstruct it, it shows you that that's crazy. But Daniel didn't have a limit for what God can do. And even though it sounded crazy that he knew that the stakes were high, but high stakes is what makes our prayers sincere. And when our prayers are sincere, those are the ones that God loves to listen to. So he took it to God, even realizing that this sounded crazy. And the beautiful part of that is that it was revealed to Daniel. When he showed up sincere, when he showed up in desperation, when he showed up with his friends, you know, in a community, God showed up to that. And he showed up in a night vision. And God was faithful, and he chose to reveal this to Daniel. And if we are honest with ourselves, it doesn't always go that way. Right? I think that a lot of the times we think, like, if I'm really, really faithful, or if I pray really, really hard, God's going to give me what I'm praying for. 
right? That happened here. But if we're honest, that doesn't always happen that way. But that's where you go back to the, to the thing that Sayyidina told me. He says, do you trust him, right? Not do you trust him to give you what you want, right? If we only trust him to give him what we want, then we end up being spoiled children, right? But do we trust that he is good in everything, in, what, in, in, the, in the blessings and even sometimes what looks like the hard stuff? Like, do we trust him across the board, right? So he goes and he does reveal this to Daniel. So Daniel blesses the God of heaven, right? The first thing he does is he turns it right back to praise. How else could we respond, right? I'm going to ask you, we, we, we have a line in the liturgy too. It's also found here where it talks about we bless you. Like, am I the only one that when I hear that, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. How can we bless God? Like, do we have anything to offer that we can bless him? Is there anything that we can give him that he's going to get truly like, wow, that was, yeah, thanks, Pete, I needed that? Right? Like, the thought blows my mind, and I think of like the only thing I have to offer is my will and my praise. Really? Like, that, that's all it is. And that's what, and honestly, that's what Daniel gave him, right? He, he basically took his will and he says, I'm going to do hard things for you, right? Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve you. Right? And with my mouth and also my will, I'm going to praise you. But really, that's all we can offer. We can offer devotion and praise, and that's all. Right? But I love how he praises him. And I love how he blesses him. When you start getting into 20 to 23, right? It says, he changes, he removes, he knows. Right? He changes, he removes, and he knows. And here, he's praising him for his, his power and his might. Right? He knows and he's experienced that God is command of all things, right? There is no one mightier than God. Even Nebuchadnezzar, who was the most powerful person on the earth at that time with this huge empire that conquered anything it looked at. He says, even as great as he is, I know someone greater, right? Even as bad as it looks, right? I know somebody greater who's in charge of everything. You know, he's mightier than all, even Nebuchadnezzar. Then he goes on and he says, he gives and he reveals, so Daniel's praising. He says he gives and he reveals. And what he's praising here, he's praising how such a big and mighty God still communicates with man. And if that doesn't blow your mind, like he doesn't need to communicate with us. To be honest, he doesn't need anything from us, nor does he need to give us anything. But in his goodness, he still communicates with man, with man. The greatness of God wouldn't have helped in this situation if God stayed silent. So he was grateful that this great God revealed his great knowledge. And then he goes on and he praises a little bit more. It says, you have given and you have made known to us. Right? You have given and you have made known to us. Once he received, he had full faith that he had everything that he needed. Once he got that vision, it's like, you know, he got the beginning of the answer and he knew what the end was going to be, right? He didn't wait to see the result. He didn't wait till he had confirmation. He didn't wait to go to Nebuchadnezzar and say, hey, this is what everything means. Are we good now? Right? The second that he knew, he knew that he had received everything that he needed. And what I love about Daniel in this, in this part of it here is my faith, you know, or actually all of our faith could be measured by how long it takes us to start praising God, right? If I had to be honest, like I might not praise him until like it's done and not just like a little bit done. I'm talking like I might not praise him until it's like done, done, right? Because maybe, because maybe it's just my week, but my, my, or my faith, my faith is weak, Right? But a greater faith is showed when you can praise God the second that you've received, right? But usually what do we do? We put it before God and he starts working. We say, okay, God, we're on track. We're on track. We're on track. And then he does a little bit. Okay, all right. We're almost complete, you know. And then the praise doesn't come out until it's all said and done, wrapped with a pretty bow and behind us, right? But not Daniel. Daniel knew right away, right away. So then he goes, Daniel goes to see the king right? And it's funny, so he talks to the guy who, who's kind of like the middleman between him and the king. His name is um, Arioch, 
right? So he goes in and he talks to Arioch and he tells him, hey, like, you know, I, I got the vision, I've got the interpretation, this and that. And the first thing Arioch does is he runs over to the king and he says, hey, I found a man. Like, I found, I found a man who can do this. Okay. Excuse me. Right? Like, I, 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 it, it was me. Like, I found this guy. And I thought about that, right? Because I thought, what, what was this guy about? This guy wanted the credit, right? Like, he didn't, he didn't do anything, <laughs> right? Like, he, first thing he told Daniel was, we're going to kill you, right? And then Daniel came back. Daniel says, hey, I have an interpretation. And then all of a sudden, this guy's like, hey, like, you know, I found a man. Um, the reality is, uh, is he didn't find a man. A man found him, right? So Daniel, on the other hand, if you read through the chapter, he takes no credit at all. Everything that's given to him is a revelation from God, and he gives all of the credit to God. So I'm going to ask you guys, how are you on needing credit? Because that's what we see here. We see one person who's so needy that they need to take credit for everything, right? And we have another character here who is completely selfless in that even though he's the one that got the message. He's the one who's going to basically like interpret it. And, you know, it would have been very easy for him to take a shred of credit, right? But he didn't want to take any of it. Daniel gave all the glory to God. And then he goes and he actually starts interpreting the dream and he, and he breaks it down and the dream's kind of like long and, you know, but I'll tell you, he tells him the dream and breaks it down into detail. Like, like very, very specific detail. You know, there's this thing, it's made, it's, you know, made from different material. We've got fine gold, silver, bronze, iron, um, part of iron, part of clay. <coughs> and actually, I'm going to skip all of this stuff, but that breaks down into, into pieces. And he actually, like, it's clear that this guy knew exactly what King Nebuchadnezzar's dream was. And then, first he gave the dream just to give him the credibility. Then afterwards, he explains it to detail right? Like you are the head of gold, right? Strong kingdom. Gold was the strongest of the, of the materials used. There was three to come after you and they're only going to get weaker. But then finally, there's going to be a kingdom set up from God, right? And here's the weird thing about dreams. Dreams, like, dreams only make sense after they come to pass, right? So even when, when Nebuchadnezzar is hearing this dream, it makes absolutely no sense because in his mind, there is no kingdoms after mine, right? Like his kingdom was so powerful. He's like, I'm like, dude, the Babylon empire is going to rule forever, right? But he breaks it down. He basically tells him there's going to be the Babylons of this and this and this and all of this other stuff, right? Um, actually, I'm going to skip that, skip that, skip that. It gets down, basically ends up talking about like the heavenly kingdom. And the last one, the stone cut without hands is the Messiah. Um, and it says the dream is certain and his interpretation is sure. And I love the fact that Daniel didn't second guess anything. He didn't analyze anything. Through him, Daniel announced the things that were not going to make sense for like centuries to come. The only reason that God can predict the futures because he's the one that wrote it. And God is completely outside of time. There's not a single situation in your life right now that God doesn't already know is going to come or how it's going to be fulfilled. Because God is outside of everything. So Nebuchadnezzar, who finally had his interpretation, finally found this man who can tell him what his dream actually was. What do you think his reaction was? He fell on his face. The most powerful man in the world at that time just fell on his face. And I'm going to tell you that that's huge, right? It, it's huge because who did he fall on his face in front of? A slave, right? A slave that he brought into captivity, right? Who was really nothing, right? He was obviously impressed, right? This was not a reaction that anyone would ever think that they would see from the great king, Nebuchadnezzar, right? This man did not show respect to anybody, especially a foreign slave who should have been executed. Like he, this, this slave already had a death sentence written for him, right? But that same foreign slave that should have been executed, you know, confirmed was the only one who was able to not only confirm what the dream was and actually what it meant. And I love what he says to him. He says, your God is the God of gods. 
And that's a big statement coming from Nebuchadnezzar, who was a pagan. And he worshipped almost anything he wanted to worship, and he had many, many gods, right? But what God did was so clear that it wasn't Daniel who had figured it out. It only could be Daniel's God. And Daniel wanted to show glory to God, and he did. And I'm going to tell you something. That should be the prayer for every single one of our lives. God, if there's something good inside of me, God, if there's something that somebody looks at and says, hey, this person does this really well, or this person does that really well, or this person's a little bit different, that you get all of the glory. Like, I don't need any of it. Everything that we should do should be a straight mirror to see God's goodness. And the question I asked earlier, that's a piece of it. Like, how much, how much credit do you need? Because if you are needy for your credit, then I, I fear that you won't be able to give the glory to God because you're going to want it for yourself. But here you have Daniel who just basically, in his selflessness, in his need for no glory, was able to not only interpret the dream, but it was so clear and he gave all the credit to God that he brought this pagan king, the most powerful pagan king, to his knees. And then the ironic part of that, right, because Daniel was so selfless in what he did, he was such a great vessel to be used by God in a situation like this, what did the king do? He promoted him. Do you think Daniel was looking for that? No. He never, he never cared. He never cared, right? But not only did he spare his life, but he gave him a huge promotion. And this is where you like, there's these nice little nuggets in the Bible where like, you know, it's so easy to like overlook it. But that part in the Bible, you would be like, man, how do you think Daniel felt at this point in time? First of all, can we all agree that he was probably relieved? Because this guy, <laughs> just earlier in the same chapter, right? They're like, hey, man, like you're going to get killed, right? But he could have been like very, very relieved. He could have been very, very happy. He could have been like, man, all right, I'm getting a promotion out of this. That's kind of cool too, right? But you know what his response was? Don't promote me unless you're going to promote my friends. I didn't do this on my own, right? Even at that point where he already said, like, you know, the message was from God, God's the one who gets the glory, and all of this other stuff, and Nebuchadnezzar's like, your, your God is the God of gods, this and that, this and that, this and that, I'm going to promote you. He says, I can't even take the credit for that because it wasn't me by myself. I have these three friends, and they're the ones that prayed with me, and, and, and if you're going to promote me, you're going to promote them too, Right? So you think about how beautiful that is, that even when he was being elevated, he was just like, I can't, you have to elevate those two, right? And that's a beautiful thing. And I'm going to tell you that that's what we're called to. Like a lot of the times we think that like, you know, I just need to get, you know, I need to get better. I need to get stronger. I need to pray more. I need to be more spiritual. I need to feel more connected with God. But I'm going to tell you that we are, we are called to lift all of those around us as well that we were never, ever meant to be lifted on our own, right? This is not just about me getting higher, Peter getting higher, you know, anybody getting out. Like, no, we were all meant to come, and why do we get together? So we can lift each other up. This is not a solo sport. And with the exception of the hermits, right, I don't even know if it's even possible to get higher on your own, right, to get lifted on your own. I think it's a series of us lifting each other up because there's going to be times where I'm not doing the lifting. It could be one of my brothers, right? And then when it's not him, it could be another one. But this is for 100% a team sport, all lifting each other. And then when, it, when we all lift each other, then we all grow together. And I think that's such a beautiful thing that we see here in Daniel too because you see Daniel, every step of the way, he didn't do it on his own. He wouldn't take credit for it. And then even when he was going to reap the rewards, he couldn't reap them on his own either. He had to involve those who were with him. Does anybody have any questions, comments, or concerns? Okay. You guys have a minute for a shameless plug? All right, shameless plug. This is what we do on Thursday nights, guys. So I see men. I see men here, right? Actually, you came last. Not last time, but a couple times ago. But um, this, is, this is kind of what we do on Thursday nights. And I encourage it. Every guy that comes, we have a great time. Um, but if you have time on Thursday nights, this is where we come. This is where the men come together to lift each other up. All are welcome. We get together at 730 and we eat first because we love food. But then at eight o'clock, we'll, we'll open up the Bible. We'll go through a chapter together and we, and we get deeper into it. 
and, uh, and I pray that the men can join us. So, um, and if any of the men are encouraged, this, this week will be Daniel 5. So um, let's stand up and pray. What's up? I don't care about the women's group. We can, okay, I'm just, <laughs> are they starting this week? Is this? Okay, February 6th. Oh, so that is this week. That is this week. Yeah. So the women's 7.30? 7.30 up here. They're doing something else. All right. What is it? Oh, the tabernacle, which is a great study. Actually, that's a great study. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you because there's so much wisdom in your word. Such great examples that have been put before us, Lord. And not only where we get to see your goodness and your graciousness, Lord, and how you interact with the least of us, Lord. How your heart is for us, Lord. How you listen to our prayers, how you show up, how you're faithful. Lord, but also we can see how how you have these great cloud of witnesses, Lord, that that we can mimic as well. Because, Lord... We know, Lord, that that we get torn in so many different directions and so many times, Lord, we just want to live in Babylon. We just want to enjoy Babylon. We get distracted by the things around us, Lord, but truly the best gift is always to keep our eyes on you, Lord. You are the one that lifts us up. You're the one who does the best things for us, Lord. So I ask that this week that you draw every one of us into a deeper intimacy with you, Lord, that we'll be that will be drawn to you, Lord, that will want to hear from you, that will communicate with you, Lord, the same way that Daniel received his vision, Lord. I ask you to give every single person in here visions, Lord, so that we see you, that we hear you, Lord, and then ultimately, Lord, that we fall deeper in love with you. I ask that you forgive us our sins, Lord, and for those of us that are wrestling, Lord, I ask that you just teach us to cut it off. Just cut it off, Lord. If there's aspects of our life that is not pleasing, if there's aspects of our life that is not answering the questions that we're, that we're asking, Lord. I ask that you just cut it off. I ask that you forgive us our sins, Lord. Hear these prayers, live in sessions of your Holy Virgin Mother, St. Mary, all your saints and martyrs. Here's way one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven.